there's a longer path for particles with mass, like electrons. Remember, this is electrons and anything with mass. You use the de Broglie equation here to figure out the momentum. And now the interesting thing is, remember I said that momentum is a unit of, uh, it, momentum measures your motion. But kinetic energy is a different way of measuring your motion. They both depend on your speed. So the idea is, if you know the momentum, you can figure out how fast something is going. And once you know how fast it's going, you can figure out its kinetic energy. These are linked through the V over here. Since these are linked through the V, when you know the momentum, you know the kinetic energy. So this is a common type of conversion you'll have to do on a bunch of problems, and probably on the test as well. All right, so the wavelength tells us the momentum, but that tells us the speed, which tells us the kinetic energy, and that gives us the energy of the electron. And again, the classic mistake that students make is when they're asked what the energy of the electron is, they try to use these formulas down here, but these are only for photons, so we should always write pH for photons down here, whereas this is for particles with mass. So it's good to have both of these flowcharts in one place, because you might be doing problems involving both electrons and photons. And then it's important not to get confused about when you're using these equations and when you're using these equations. Okay. It's making sense so far? Okay, um, let's try to squeeze in the uh, uncertainty principle to today as well. So is that something you've seen, seen discussed in yeah. class yet? Okay, so here we have another weird prediction of modern physics. So in classical physics, you can measure things as precisely as you like. In classical physics, you can measure things as precisely as you like. Um, you can always measure um, things more precisely. However, in modern physics, it turns out that there's a limit on how precisely you can measure things. There's always going to be some uncertainty. So here's the equation for the uncertainty principle. Uh, by the way, it was Heisenberg that came up with this. So this is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, this delta here doesn't exactly, doesn't exactly stand for what it usually stands for. It's not exactly the change in x anymore. It's our uncertainty. And what, what, are, what, are, what are our units usually for x? So this is the uncertainty about position. This is how uncertain we are about the position of the object. And this is how uncertain we are about the momentum of the object. And you can see, oh, well, you can see I messed up. I should have written this as an inequality. This is supposed to be an inequality where the left-hand side is bigger than or equal to the right-hand side. So you can see that there's a, a, a minimum value for the uncertainties here. If you multiply these two uncertainties, they're always bigger than h bar. So this is saying that there is a limit on how precisely we can measure things. Um, so delta x is the uncertainty in position. So for example, let's say that we know that a particle is in a box, uh, a linear box. You're actually going to see a lot of problems here about particles in linear boxes. Uh, of course, in real life, particles would be in three-dimensional boxes, but the math is too hard for that. So you're usually going to work with linear boxes. So let's say that uh, in this course, you won't be working too much with three dimensions, just with linear boxes to keep the math from being too hard. So let's say that we know the particle is in this linear box between these two walls. Well, then delta x would be this distance. Um, the reason I want to emphasize that is you might think that maybe delta x would be this distance, but that's not what it is. Delta x is the total width of uh, where it could be. So that was wrong when I had the second ago. This is what delta x stands for. If we know the particle is between these two walls, if we know the particle is here, that would be our delta x. And then delta p is the uncertainty in momentum. And let's explicate what that means a little bit more. So for example, suppose that we know that the momentum is between 3 kilograms meters per second and negative 3 kilograms meters per second. Let's say we know the momentum is in that range. We know that the momentum is between these two numbers. Well, then what would delta P be? Yeah, 6 kilograms meters per second. 
per second. Again, I think it might be tempting to think that delta P was three, as if that was only half of the uncertainty. Uh, but no, the delta stands for the complete range of uh, the complete range of where it could be. So you can't just take the numbers for the momentums and use that to find the delta P. It helps to just make the little flow chart here. Um, if, the, if you're between three and negative three, the delta P is six over here. Just like if this is between, say, positive five meters and negative five meters, what would delta X be? I guess you can see where the delta is coming in, because this would be five minus negative five, and delta P would be three minus negative three. So we are doing a subtraction the way we normally would with the delta. All right, so that's what the delta P stands for here. And then H bar is not exactly H, it's H bar. So when you look at your printouts or when you look at the computer screen, you have to stare really hard because sometimes it's hard to see the bar. Some formulas have the bar and some don't. Um, and it turns out that H bar is H divided by 2 pi. If I'm remembering that correctly. Yeah, H bar is H divided by 2 pi. It just so happens that some formulas involve h, and some involve h divided by 2 pi. So to save notation, they invented the h bar symbol for that. So in your cheat sheet, you want to make very clear. Um, so I guess we've seen two formulas so far with h. We've seen the energy of a photon equation with h, and with the Broglie wavelength <coughs> with h. But the uncertainty principle has h bar. So you just want to have those clearly in your notes. By the way, is h big or small? Remember, what was H, Planck's constant? That was 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34. Very small. So of course, H bar is very small. That means that the minimum uncertainty is very small. That's why we normally don't notice it. We normally don't notice this. That's the correspondence principle again. Um, so H, this might tell us that we can't measure the, the position more accurately than to within, say, a femtometer. All right, well, that is not normally a big obstacle in ordinary life. In ordinary life, we don't need to get a femtometer accuracy. So that's the correspondence principle again. The uncertainty principle turns out only to be important, say, at very, when you're focusing on very small distances, say. In ordinary life, um, we can measure things so accurately that we don't notice the uncertainty. And the reason why for that, again, is that Planck's constant is so small. So if I was an instructor and I wanted to write a really cool test question, I would say, what would the universe be like if Planck's constant was 10 to the negative 10 and 10 to, instead of 10 to the negative 34? And it would just mean that all of this quantum physics stuff would be much more apparent in ordinary life um, because then we have a bigger number here. Okay. Not, not many physics instructors would be as cool as me, I guess, uh -huh. so, for, for better or worse. All right, so uh, let's see here. So let's look at a typical way this is tested. Find the minimum energy for an electron. So it turns out that atoms have a diameter of about 0.1 nanometers, and we want to find the minimum energy for an electron that is confined uh, to an atom like this. Let's just go through this together. Now, first of all, what would classical physics say the minimum energy is? Classical physics would say the minimum energy, I guess, is zero. All right, it would seem like you could have zero energy. All right, but it turns out that the uncertainty principle says that you have to have some energy. We can already see why. Because if it had no energy, it would be motionless. And then we would know exactly where it is, and we know exactly its momentum. 
well, that would violate, well, I erased it, but that would violate our uncertainty principle. So this shows that everything has to have some energy, because otherwise you would know exactly what its momentum is, or exactly what its position is. Uh, it seems like you could have no energy. It seems like this chalk holder could be completely still, but even when it seems still, it still has very tiny movement that we're not seeing. All right, I'm really focusing on the chalk holder today. All right, so uh, let's see. So let's use our equation here for the uncertainty principle. Delta x, delta p equals h bar. 